Well, hello. Welcome back to Come Follow Me with Fair Faithful Answers to New Testament Questions. We are working our way through. We're on week 38 of this project. That's just crazy to me. Time is flying. My name is Jennifer Roach. We are talking through the New Testament as we read it in Come Follow Me, um, looking at some of the places where evangelicals might have questions about us, we might have questions about them, trying to help you understand your evangelical friends and family a little bit better and where they're coming from on some of these topics, just so that you might have a better conversation with them, not pa talk past each other, and even be able to share some good things from our faith with them in a way they can actually understand. So before we get to that, quick announcement for you first. I should have been telling you about this for weeks, and I have not. So here we go. This coming weekend, Friday, September 22nd to the 23rd, there is an online-only conference put on by FAIR, um, and the focus is on evidences for the Book of Mormon. I am so excited about this. It's very, it's really different than our conference in August, which is just broad and lots and lots of topics. This one is very focused. It's free. It's online only. You can watch from the Latter-day, the Fair Latter-day Saints YouTube channel, which I know some of you watch this on YouTube. Most of you don't. If you don't, you can navigate over to the YouTube Fair Latter-day Saints channel and watch them there live this weekend, or you can watch them anytime after that. I am not presenting, but um, I do get to be involved a little bit and do some introductions of speakers and ask questions afterward. I will happily do the work in exchange for getting to hang out with some very smart people all day long. Super excited about that Friday evening. Presentation is none other than Richard Bushman. Um, Richard Bushman wrote Rest on Rolling. I read that while I was still investigating the church. I read it in conjunction with reading Doctrine and Covenants for the first time. And my goodness, was that a great um, kind of rhythm to have understanding the narrative that was behind all of these chapters that are rather hard to understand, just sort of completely out of context. Um, so I am a huge fan of Brother Bushman and cannot wait to hear what he has to say. Saturday, all day long, a whole variety of speakers. Stephen Smoot will be there. Stephen is probably the most up-to-date scholar on Book of Abraham issues, not Book of Mormon issues, and he just still snuck his little way into this conference, but he's brilliant, um, and you need to hear what he has to say about Book of Abraham if you haven't yet. Um, there will also be a presentation by two men, both named Spencer. I've told both of them that they are my favorite Spencer, and I hope I'm not put in the position where I actually have to choose. Their talk has jokingly been titled The Revealing of the One True Spencer, <laughs> but in reality, it's about 2 Nephi 19.1, which can be a rather puzzling verse. They've got some great research on it that you're going to want to hear. There are several good talks on archaeology, some of the challenges around that, ancient artifacts. Um, I will be there live with the speakers. But the conference is online. You can stream it on the Fair YouTube channel or watch it later. You'll get a little peek from me, but no, I don't. I'm not talking. You, we're gonna hear people way smarter than me. Okay, we are gonna talk about levels of heaven today. Our jumping off verse is 2 Corinthians 12:2. This is in the English Standard Version. I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up to the third heaven, whether it was in body or out of body, I do not know. God knows. Um, I, I have noticed in my, in my four years of being in the church, Latter-day Saints are sometimes completely confused by why evangelicals don't accept this idea that there, there are, there's a third heaven implying there's a second and a first heaven. Um, evangelicals completely reject this idea but it's right there in the Bible after all, and they love the Bible. So it sort of is confusing. Like, why don't they read this the same way that we read it? So I want to talk you through how and why they see this verse in 2 Corinthians the way that they do. And we'll talk about some intersections with our faith and some ways the conversation might go help you out on this topic. Okay. 
I don't have research to back this up, but my sense, my own experience is that if you asked most evangelicals what Paul means by the third heaven, they would not understand the question. It It's considered a really obscure verse in a book that they don't spend all that much time in. The evangelicals don't spend that much time in, in 2 Corinthians. It's it's a lot, right? Um, it's considered this obscure verse. Um, so the average evangelical might not even know that this is in scripture. So pointing it out, like that's an interesting conversation in and of itself. But for those who do know that it's in there, they actually do a pretty interesting little um interpretive move here they move towards the concrete or the physical instead of towards the spiritual and i want to explain to you why and what they're doing but first it brings this bigger question why do we or why does anyone take some verses literally and and some spiritually or metaphorically evangelicals and latter-day saints both use this technique but at different times and for different reasons. So the, the kind of cynical explanation here is no matter which group you're in, the other group, the one that's opposite of you, well, they're doing this only for convenience, only to like shoehorn their doctrine in. Um, it's just a, a really sort of cynical way to look at scripture and it maybe doesn't shed the best light for understanding either group. Um, I think both both groups are approaching this in a way more complex way. Um, Latter-day Saints and evangelicals and every religion or denomination out there are heavily, heavily influenced by a set of interpretive rules called hermeneutics. So hermeneutic hermeneutics are the rules that you use to interpret a passage. And here you can choose a or a physical literal hermeneutic, or you could choose a, a spiritual one. There's lots of others, um, but the one that you're using determines how you're going to interpret a passage. Let me make an analogy for you. I know hermeneutics is not something Latter-day Saints talk about a lot. So let me make an analogy that might help you understand where I'm going. In English, there is a proper order for adjectives in a sentence. An adjective is a descriptive word, and if you string a bunch of them together in the wrong order, your sentence is not going to sound right. However, if you ask almost any native English speaker to name that order, they can't do it. I can't do it. I had to look up the order to, for this talk to make sure that I got it right. It's a rule that I follow, but I don't even know I'm following it. You probably don't either. I just know that it sounds right. The, the order is, if you're talking, if you're going to string adjectives together, this is the order they have to go in. Quantity, quality, size, age, shape, color, proper adjectives, nationality, something like that, and then purpose. So a classic example of getting this order correct is the sentence, I love that really big old green antique car. And if you're a native speaker, this sounds right to your ears. While I love that antique green old big car, it just doesn't sound right. It sounds clunky. There's something wrong with it. We don't even necessarily know what the rule is that's being broken there. We just know it doesn't, it doesn't sound good. Um, you follow this rule without even knowing it exists. And hermeneutics are like that. Knowing when to read literally and like physically and knowing when to read something as spiritual is a rule that you follow without even knowing that it's a rule. And evangelicals and Latter-day Saints have developed in, in different cultural contexts and we have some different rules for when to use which one. So when um, something is interpreted by a Latter-day Saint, it often just doesn't sound right to evangelical ears and vice versa. And, and honestly, a lot of what that comes down to is we're just in 
employing different hermeneutical rules on different occasions. So what are the evangelical rules for interpretation of a verse like this one in 2 Corinthians? They interpret this verse literally by saying that the first heaven refers to the atmosphere where the birds live. And yes, that is how it is normally phrased. The atmosphere where the birds live. The second heaven is the stars and the planets, the sun, all of outer space. And the third heaven is the dwelling place where God lives. So they take this sentence that we look at and see a spiritual meaning all the way through. They're employing some physical meaning here. First heaven, it's where the birds live. I know Latter-day Saints, that doesn't sound right to your ears. They're using a different hermeneutic and that's why. I think the tendency here for Latter-day Saints is, is maybe just to claim like, well, they get this wrong because they don't have the spirit. They can't interpret correctly. And to be honest, evangelicals would say that about us. Um, so it's not a very satisfying answer either way. And it probably just breeds more us versus them than really is good for anybody. So let me offer a couple different ways to understand what they're doing here and why. So first, you remember from past episodes that the evangelical movement, it's not even a hundred years old, and it really came of age alongside the baby boomers. It is very much a post-World War II American invention. The cultural mix at the time was encouraging everyone to move into the modern world with all of its conveniences. The two great wars are over. Like we are gonna move on into some good times. Uh, evangelicals in that era did not want to be seen as old fuddy-duddies. That was their driving, <laughs> it's the driving element. It's not like there weren't churches in their denominations and their in their Protestant world preaching the gospel, there were the people who become evangelicals, they just look at them and say, oh, they're so old fashioned, we just can't stand it. Um, if you're close to my age, our family lines might, might um, play out in a similar fashion. My mother was born in the first wave of the baby boom. Her parents were both born in the, the 19 teens, 1917, 1918. And all four of her grandparents were born in the 1800s. So the evangelical movement rises up with these new baby boomers whose parents and grandparents seemed like they were from an entirely different era. And, and to be fair, they, they sort of were, like the world really, really changed the first 50 years of the 20th century. It just did. So the evangelicals then, they wanted an entirely different version of church than what their parents and their grandparents had, which was out of fashion in their way of thinking. Too strict, too fundamentalist, too boring, too old, too grandma. Um, and they find what they're looking for in this developing evangelical movement. The evangelicals were a reaction to the fundamentalists who came before them. But like with every reactionary movement, the very thing that they're reacting against often kind of gets smuggled right in anyway, despite their best efforts. And in this case, we're talking about the temptation to interpret in an overly literal or physical way. So it gets confusing for them here. They will say things like, the Bible is the literal word of God. At face value, what that sentence means is that God's message to us is found in this book we call the Bible. But what it gets morphed into, especially in the evangelical culture, is something like everything in the Bible should be taken literally. Now, they don't do this exactly like the fundamentalists who came before them do, but they still do it. Um, to, to a pretty a pretty big degree, a, a literal interpretation is, is where they like to go, a, the simplest reading possible. 
So it leaves you in a really weird place, though, if you read in, say, Luke, for example, where Jesus says that he he gathers us up like baby chicks under his wings. Um, because of the rule of everything should be taken literally, it falls apart right there, right? Unless you want to think of Christ as this giant chicken, and all of us are actually little little baby chicks. Like it, There's no way to take that literally. And evangelicals would agree with that. Evangelicals are not going around saying that we're all actually secretly chickens. Um, what, what has happened with evangelicals is that their interpretive rule or their hermeneutic is something like, in order to take scripture seriously, you have to take it literally whenever possible. And when it's not possible, you must find the spiritual meaning instead. In other words, if it can be taken literally, take it literally. And if it can't, find something spiritual in it. Evangelicals will get a little squirmy if you try to say this too plainly, though. When you ask, do you take the Bible literally? Um, if they were asking that, what they're really asking is, do you think the Bible is actually true? The, the word literal here, it's morphing in meaning. And it's not just happening in evangelical, it's happening in in all of English speaking society. Words change meaning, they morph meaning within the context of a culture. And we see that right here, the word literal no longer literally means literal, right? Um, it leaves the evangelicals with the sense that the literal meaning has to come first because they've equated that with taking the Bible seriously, believing that it's true. It's actually one of the problems they were trying to get away from with the fundamentalists and, and they just, they ended up bringing it right along with them. So when they look at this verse about the third heaven here in two Corinthians, their first impulse is to look for a literal meaning. Remember, these rules are often invisible to people, just like the rules of English about what order adjectives go in. Everybody follows that rule, and most people don't know it exists. Evangelicals follow this rule, even if they don't know it exists. Latter-day Saints follow our own rules, too. We'll get to that. Um, evangelicals have a second hermeneutic here that reinforces the first. And it goes something like this. If another verse in the Bible mentions the same thing, it should be used to enhance or bring out the meaning of all the other verses that also mention that thing. So um, evangelicals were the first ones to come up with a, the, a chain reference system, essentially, where they're linking all of these verses together. And for a while, they went real crazy about, well, this verse mentions this, and this verse mentions this. Therefore, those two verses are related, when in reality, they might not be related remotely. And sometimes they say opposite things. But here's what they do in this verse. Evangelicals interpret the first heaven to be the atmosphere and where the birds are, and they back that up with a verse like Deuteronomy 28, 12, which says, the Lord will open for you his good storehouse, the heavens to give rain to your land in its season. Okay. So they're talking about the literal clouds and rain, that the portion of space that exists between us and wherever outer space starts. Someone tell me in the comments where outer space starts. I'm not scientifically minded enough to remember that off the top of my head. Evangelicals see this as a perfectly valid explanation, the literal first, right? So instead of saying, what's the first heaven mean? They don't know they're doing this, but the first question in their mind is, is there a way for us to take this literally? And if there's a perfectly valid way of understanding that, they go with it. And they see this as working out all the way, first heaven, second heaven, third heaven. So Paul mentions a third heaven, implying that there are first and second heaven. Um, can, can we interpret that literally? Yes, 
And we have scriptures to do so. A literal interpretation works and therefore it should be used. That's what evangelicals would say. Um, Latter-day Saints, we have our own history of why things are interpreted the way that they have been. And to be honest, we face the same reality that evangelicals do. Many of the rules that we use for interpretation are invisible to us. We just know when it sounds right to, to our ears and when it doesn't sound right. And, and evangelicals would say the same thing. My experience has been, maybe yours has been different. I would love to hear about it in the comments if it has. But my experience has been that the hermeneutic Latter-day Saints most often use something probably called a mandatory hermeneutics, which just means that we've been given additional information and amendments that gives some kind of clarity on what the Bible is talking about through either the Book of Mormon, our modern prophets, some other modern scripture. In general, in general, we would look at a verse like this about the third heaven and easily be able to quote all kinds of modern revelation to help us understand what a third heaven actually means. But imagine for a minute how you would be floundering for meaning without that. You, you too might say, well, the first heaven is where the, the birds are and the second heaven is where the planets are, I guess. Third heaven must be where God is. They're, they're sort of, I mean, it probably feels to you like they're just like grasping at what they can. Well, they don't use an amendatory hermeneutic. Absolutely not. They, that is, that is not in their toolkit. Um, but as Latter-day Saints, we have that. Um, our temptation, Latter-day Saint friends, is that we can be overly quick to jump to well, this part of the Bible is clearly not translated correctly, so I don't have to do any work or study or try to tease out any meaning whatsoever. I'm just going to write it all off under the banner of not translated correctly, moving on, um, which is a grave error, in my opinion. You can find a lot of meaning um, for Things in the Bible specifically that might not be obvious at first, learn to study a little bit um, and you'll start learning how to dig some meaning out. Um, sometimes Latter-day Saints, we also take the, the opposite sort of problem or the opposite solution to the problem. And we try to make modern revelation sometimes explain things that it doesn't necessarily apply. Sometimes we make connections with something a prophet says that they themselves didn't make, that they themselves are not talking about. Sometimes we over-interpret what the, the prophet is saying. Um, Latter-day Saints can also go a little heavy on literal interpretation. We did not escape the first 50 years of the 20th century either. And that's when literal... And, and I mean literal in the literal way, is when literal interpretation was king. Um, just like the evangelicals, we're impacted by that way of thinking too. Um, the early half of the 20th century was dominated by literal and fundamentalist thinking in our church too. Um, and we're still kind of unwinding some of that, to be honest. Okay, how do you talk about this concept with your evangelical friends? I've got two thoughts first. Jesus doesn't ever use the phrase um, levels of heaven, kingdoms of heaven. The, the, the only place you find this is this verse from Paul. Um, so evangelicals do tend to say like, this is just an obscure little verse. We don't know what it means. I'm not gonna pay attention to it. But the Bible does talk about varying degrees of reward in heaven and makes it clear the certain things we do here on earth will bring more reward and certain things bring less reward. Here's an example, Matthew 5. Jesus says that there's a great reward for those who are persecuted. Meaning that the people who did not have to go through this kind of persecution, persecution might not be rewarded in the same way. Jesus is offering them this compensatory promise for their suffering they suffered faithfully in his name and he wants them to know um you are going to be rewarded for this and that's different 
than it is for somebody who didn't go through this. The very next chapter, Matthew 6, Jesus is talking about how some folks really want to draw attention to the fact that they're giving to the poor. Jesus says these people have their reward in full. They got the attention they were looking for. There will be no further reward for them in heaven. Interesting. Implying the one who gives their, their almsgiving is the King James word for it. The one who gives their tithing, their offering in a quiet way, not trying to draw attention to themselves. They're the ones who get a reward. So you, we're starting to see the New Testament talks a lot about different levels of reward. Um, Romans 2, Paul tells us that God will give to every man based on his deeds. 1 Corinthians 3, Paul tells us that our works will be judged. Some of those works will going to burn up and some will endure. And those that produce works that endure will be rewarded. And those who don't won't. All this to say, pointing out that there are many passages in the New Testament that describe different degrees of reward might open up some conversation really nicely and at least setting the stage for there's going to be some differences in heaven. Whether you want to call that rewards, whether you want to call that kingdoms, I kind of don't care. The concept is the same. I think that's an interesting conversation for evangelicals. Second thought, um, read the book, The Great Divorce by C.S. Lewis. It's fiction. It's a, it's a very easy read. I think the audiobook is like three hours. And if you listen to it a little bit faster speed, like I like to listen, you'll get done in way fewer than three hours. Um, Lewis was not a member of our faith. And at times, I mean, to be fair, said some kind of snarky things about our faith. But even still, in The Great Divorce, he sees the same truth that we're talking about here. here. Here's the basic plot of that book. So it's set in the afterlife. And people from the lower kingdoms here represented by this large kind of noisy, polluted city, they're given a chance to go on a bus ride to the higher kingdoms. And in the book, the higher kingdoms are thought of as being closer to God. Um, there's the city and then the countryside. It's a little bit closer in this book. God lives on the mountaintop. So the countryside is a little bit closer to God. And then the great mountain where God lives, it's very steep. It's hard to get up there. It, it, it's, it's a difficult climb, but that is where God lives. God reigns in all three kingdoms. You might think that the people in this book who come from the noisy, polluted, large city, they're given a bus ride out into the countryside. They're given this opportunity to be a little bit closer to God and get a glimpse of what that's like. You might think that they would instantly have a desire ignited in them of wanting more of that. If you've ever felt a spiritual desire for anything, that kind of single-minded, I must have this right? You, you, you know what that feels like. Um, but the people in the book, they don't, they don't have that. What happens is they complain that the color of the grass is such a vivid green that it hurts their eyes. And, and it feels too real and too pokey when they put their feet on it. They, they complain that, that living in the countryside would require far too much of them. And they just want to get in the bus and, and go back home to the city where it's comfortable for them. The point that Lewis is making here is that people who've spent their lives preparing to live closer to God, the ones who get that impulse, the spiritual impulse of, I will do whatever it takes to follow this path and I need to do it right now as fast as I can. The people who do that, are the ones who gain the skills and the ability to live where the grass is such a bright color that it hurts the eyes of people who didn't prepare to live that way. The people who are trying to climb the great mountain to where God lives, they're going to need some training. They're going to need some muscles. They're going to need some experience. In Lewis's book, progression is 
possible. The question is, do you want it? And he's trying to make the point of prepare for the afterlife while you're alive in this life because you're going to need it. Um, and most evangelicals today don't really think that way. And Lewis never intended this to be a pro Latter-day Saint book by any means. And yet he is getting at some of the very things we are talking about with the three heavens. I actually read this book long before I investigated. I think I read it for the first time as a teenager, um, long before I investigated the church. And to be honest, it was an important piece that kind of got my brain on board um, when I first started to grapple with what is this what does this layered heaven even mean and look like? Is Lewis that snapped it into place for me? Okay, e either one of those directions I think would be a wonderful conversation for you and evangelical friends. I hope this episode has given you some ideas about how to understand better where they're coming from. And maybe how to share with them this beautiful doctrine that we have that God wants us to be close to him. And we can spend our lives preparing to do that. Um, and maybe you might be able to tell that to an evangelical friend in a way that they can actually hear. Um, next week, we are going to talk about the phrase, another gospel in Galatians. It will be a fun time for all. I look forward to it. I'll see you then.